Good morning. Good morning. There is a commercial which asks or tells us about threes being important or somehow better for you. When I first entered upon what would be eight and a half years in seminary, my professor in one of my introductory classes asked us about things that come in threes. <laughs> well, knowing me, as you do, my first thought was the Three Stooges. <laughs> Others thought of three coins in a fountain, three blind mice, the three musketeers, and finally we were saved by a student in the back with the uh, delivery of the Holy Trinity, and uh, someone obviously much more enlightened than some of us were. So I have chosen three persons I consider to be literary giants for this message. Robert Frost, Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, and Charles Schultz, which you know from my uh, collection of ties is uh, important. All these are important people to me. So I will offer first The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for the passing there, had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how ways lead on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one last traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Well, here I am, ages and ages hence, and I, I took the road less traveled, and it has made all the difference. And I'm looking down on the less traveled road, and what do you think? I see that all of you have traveled at one time or another on that road, and some of you, perhaps like myself, are still on it. <laughs> right now, these young folks are following the footsteps of every past generation, these young folks all over the world. And they are at the mile marker of, we already know, everything there is to know. <laughs> we were there once. <laughs> you remember that, don't you? Well, Mark Twain offered his observation upon this revelation. You can change it a little bit to, uh, to fit your own circumstance, but I'll give you the, the real quotation. When I was a boy of 14, my father, was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> Given the circumstances of the world as we knew it way back when, we've learned from our past and have applied that knowledge to a future which you will inherit. A future that we have built on the foundation of our strong faith in God and the understanding of God's strong faith in us. So we give you these three little bits of advice on that sport. But remember that we will always be available if you ever seek our advice. Now peace will be realized in the willingness to occasionally leave the well-traveled road of comfortable conformity and complacency to satisfy that subtle discomfort 
that you will feel when suddenly you realize that you do not know everything. Peace will be realized as it becomes the search for truth, establishes fair and equitable justice for all peoples, and continues with the courage to keep asking those difficult questions. And peace will be realized in the knowing that there is no dark deep enough to dispel the light of truth and love that is our God. And lastly, from Charles Schultz, <laughs> and to paraphrase Linus, that's what peace is all about, Charlie Brown. <laughs> the scripture readings for this morning, the first come from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. The second reading comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 39. This is a rather long passage, but try to listen closely as there are, are a lot of important messages contained in here. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive the spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as God's children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are God's children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and follow heirs with Christ if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. I believe that the present suffering is nothing compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. The whole creation waits breathless with anticipation for the revelation of God's sons and daughters. Creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice. It was the choice of the one who subjected it, but in the hope that the creation itself will be set free from slavery to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole creation is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now. And it's not only the creation, we ourselves who have the spirit as the first crop of harvest also groan inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free. We were saved in hope. If we see what we hope for, it isn't hope. Who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit comes to help our weakness. We don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself pleads our case with unexpressed groans. The one who searches hearts know how the Spirit thinks because he pleads for the saints consistent with God's will. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God, for those are called according to his purpose. <laughs> we know this because God knew them in advance and he decided in advance that they would be conformed to the image of his son. That way his son would be the first of many brothers and sisters. Those who God decided in advance would be conformed to his son, he also called. 
those whom he called, he also made righteous. And those whom he made righteous, he also glorified. So what are we going to say about these things? If God is for us, then who is against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also freely give us all things with him? Who will bring a charge against God's elect people? It is God who acquits them. Who is going to convict them? It is Christ Jesus who died, even more, who was raised, and who also is at God's right side. It is Christ Jesus who also pleads our case for us. Who will separate us from Christ's love? Will we be separated by trouble or distress or harassment or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? As it is written, we are being put to death all day long for your sake. But in all these things, we win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death, or life, not angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth, or any other thing that is created. Well, this is, I, I know I've seen at least one other person crying in this service so far, but uh, I, the first thing we said, um, just really gets to me every time, and everything is just wonderful. I, I surely feel the spirit of God in this place today. Um, our passage from Acts gives us the short version of what happened that Pentecost morning. It was a chaotic, uh, whirlwind, a, a holy charge moment that changed all those present and continues to um, change people today. Today we celebrate the birth of the Church of Jesus Christ. And we're about to affirm the work of God's Spirit in the lives of our compliments. Ethan, Ben, Matt, Natalie, and Courtney, will, we will lay hands on them and convey a blessing of God's Spirit upon them. Because we believe, like Paul told those believers in Rome, that we are all God's children. We are affirming the choice that their parents made years ago when they brought them for baptism. We're affirming their adoption as sons and daughters of God. God made that decision of what God's children should be like. God followed it up by calling people by name. <coughs> We're affirming the work of God's Spirit in their lives up until this point, and blessing you going forward as well, too. God is with us, with all of us. God is for us. <clears throat> now, Pentecost is a time where the Holy Spirit came upon people from all over the world, gathered together, and helped them understand what the others were saying. And I want to lift up the importance of being in a space with people who don't speak the same language. I want to lift up the importance of being around people from all over the known world. Because I think we have a bad habit in our culture of seeking sameness. See, the miracle of Pentecost is that the Spirit shows up when we're mingling with difference. Not when we exclude people of other languages, whether those languages are literal or metaphoric. Now, there's a video that got a lot of attention that went viral this week. Um, and um, I challenge you, if you haven't seen it already, to go look for it on YouTube later. 
It's a video of a father and his baby. Has anyone seen it? Yeah. And they aren't exactly, they're having a conversation, this father and baby, but they aren't exactly speaking the same language um, because the baby is really speaking gibberish. He doesn't quite have language yet, but they are clearly having a conversation. There's a just an understanding you just see that's going on between them. And babies don't fake it, so. Um, <laughs> one, it's a conversation that comes from, you know, have, giving attention to each other, paying attention to each other. Um, if not from this clear vocalizations that this adorable baby makes as well, too. Now, at the end of this little encounter, the baby still speaks gibberish, and he and his parents still have translation issues they will need to work out as the baby grows up. Um, but what a gift it is when people who don't understand each other engage in conversation. That's Pentecost. As Paul said, the one who searches hearts knows how the Spirit thinks because he pleads for the saints consistent with God's will. Maybe we're the baby speaking gibberish and God is the parent who searches our hearts and because of the work of the Spirit, a conversation is had. Now, the Spirit of God was not acting on its own on that Pentecost morning. Often the way the Pentecost story is told, um, it's as, it, you know, in the, the, the book of the Acts of the Disciples, it's as if the Holy Spirit is a lone wolf, you know, and doing her own thing. But our Romans passage this morning, albeit long, uh, makes clearer the image of the work of the Spirit in the midst of the work of God and Jesus. Paul's letter to the Romans is where we turn to try to better understand the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who is at work in our lives and the life of the church all the time, not just on Pentecost. Uh, as we were singing that song, Spirit, I thought, oh, I want to sing this more often because it kind of tells the whole story of the people of God. And we need to sing that more often, not just on Pentecost. Paul was imagining a new world, one where liberation can happen, where acceptance is offered, and where hope is real. We are working on hope. We gather here to, to learn how we might live into that liberation and freedom and, and acceptance <coughs> and hope. At the start of the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, we see that th this is all about the Holy Spirit. Verse 2 states, the law of the Spirit of, the, of life in Jesus Christ has set you free. Numa is the Greek word for spirit, and it is repeated 34, 34 times just in the eighth chapter of that letter to the Romans. Paul is imagining a world where the Holy Spirit is the rule of the land, a world without fear. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, a world at one with nature. You did not receive a spirit of slavery you, the creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. A world of hope. If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. A world of power and the right kind of power. If God is for us, who is against us? And a world without condemnation. Who will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? This sounds like liberation, like freedom. It sounds like hope for change. Can you imagine a world like this? And isn't it what the disciples were imagining on that Pentecost morning? 
This is the world we want to offer each of us, but we especially want to, as we confirm and affirm the work of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, who continues to move in the lives of Courtney, Natalie, Matt, Ben, and Ethan. This is that spirit that aids us in our prayers. The word adoption is mentioned. And in the Greek, the word is different than it is in our culture, and it is to be made a child. It is a change that takes place. It, you are made an heir, and in a time when it was written, being an heir was a very big thing. You are the one who will inherit. We are heirs waiting for a promised future of honor, status, and recognition. We are, of course, suffering now at times. You can't listen to the news without thinking, oh, I'm talking about some pie and pie. There's, you know, by and by, it's not now. This is a world full of suffering. There's, there's needs, there's concerns. But the Spirit enables us to pray when we don't have the words. In size, too deep for words. We are God's adopted children. And let's face it, you're going to need that Spirit to lean on as this church moves forward. The, the pastoral search committee is going to need that Spirit to, to lean on as this church moves moves forward. Even though times things seem bad, they seem hopeless, I've heard a lot of talk in the weeks gone by about how can Federated Church of Orleans keep going on? We have older members, and how can we keep going? We can't see the future, but God assures us that the Spirit of God is at work for all things, for good. We can't see the future, but God is there. And God assures us that all will work for good. This is the Spirit that we celebrate today. Amen. Amen. Um, let us stand and sing. Uh, Sister, let me be your servant. Number 490 in your hymnal. At this time, I would like to call forward confirmation leader, Reverend Jim Ziobro, and our confirmation class journey partners, Mike Brink, Dallas Jones, uh, Pastor Bob Richardson, Mary Lee Mance, and Liz Jones. <laughs> I was honored to be a, asked to be a journey partner. Uh, it was wonderful um, to be able to find and time and spend time with with Ethan, uh, who is uh, just a wonderful young man. Um, you might not know it, but he was born in St. Petersburg, uh, Russia. He doesn't speak Russian, however. <laughs> he left Russia when he was three months old. Still time, Ethan. <laughs> um, he will be a junior uh, next year at the Nauset Beeson Regional High School, and his courses are the usual college preparatory classes, math and science. Uh, um, and, and this year he took a course in metal sculpture dedicated student, good grades, an artist. What a marvelous combination. <laughs> um, after, after going to college, he hopes uh, to be uh, an engineer eventually. His passion, however, is not academics. Although he is a good student, his passion is soccer. <laughs> or football, as, as 
we all, all know it. Um, he was on the Gnostic soccer team that won the state championship for their division last year, and he plays center back, which is a defensive position, helps keep the, the goal from being scored. Um, and he hopes that, that, that he'll be on the team this coming year, uh, and that they'll be able to repeat that championship again, with, again with help of Matt and some of the other, other teammates. Um, however, it's not enough for him to just play soccer on the, on the school team in the fall. He plays on a elite club team out of, out of Plymouth. So he, he then he can play both in, in the fall and in the spring, that's not enough. He also <laughs> plays soccer on an indoor team. Um, you might have imagined when I asked him, well, what are you going to do in college? He didn't say any of about the academics. He said, I'm going to play soccer. Is <laughs> it studying too? He said, well, yeah, if I can fit it in. <laughs> um, and after college, he, he hopes that he can be able to come, become a, a professional uh, soccer player. Ethan, as good as Messi? Yeah. <laughs> you don't know who Messi is. Messi is one of the world-renowned soccer players. A great striker, plays for Barcelona. At, the, at, at least at the moment. I mean, sometimes he moves around. Um, Ethan enjoys hanging out with his friends and going to the beach <coughs> and skimboarding. <clears throat> one of the things I found that was interesting in talking to Ethan was that one of the highlights of his confirmation journey uh, was going to Hyannis and the Youth Street Reach, where he helped cook breakfast, and as reporter, he makes a very, very mean pancake. <laughs> Amy and Kelly, so, <laughs> the breakfast. Uh, and, and in his words, and this is, this is a quote, you really get to know what, uh, what happens to them, who they are, and get a sense of where they are, and, and where they are in their life's journey. <laughs> He was impressed with the people that he met there, listening to the stories, and got an appreciation of how he got there. He told me that that has inspired him to do more work in the community. What a wonderful legacy that we're able to provide for, for him and for the other conferences. I'm sure that Amy, Kelly, Emily are very proud of, of Ethan, and I'm happy that I got to know him, and I'm happy to welcome him into our church family. You think love. Ben Kelson really is one of those rare individuals who needs no introduction. <laughs>
learning and hearing about the Bible stories and getting to know his fellow compromise and their leaders better. Ben, by nature, is a helpful person. He's worked with Pierre around the church and the, and the outside of the church. As a compromise, he willingly took on deacon duties. Ben is a person who would rather hang out with friends than play video games. He likes to come to church because he feels surrounded by nice people who care about each other and about him. I'll sum up by saying Ben is a fine young man, a pleasure to know, and a much loved presence in this church. Well, we've had all men up to this point. <laughs> Time for the women. I had the distinct pleasure of being the journey partner for Natalie Fisher. And it didn't take me very long to figure out, like Bob was just saying, that Natalie, like her brothers and these other young people, are mighty busy, going all the time, but it's a good thing too. Natalie is 14 years old. She's the youngest member of the Fisher Talmadge family and also was the youngest member of our confirmation class. 
she has in common with what we're hearing about the other young people, uh, a lot of similar interests. She plays soccer, she plays basketball. She also is a competitive rope jumper. And some of you may remember a few years ago, we had a talent show here at the church and Natalie amazed all of us with her rope jumping ability. You talk about a tough act to follow. Uh, the, the acts that came after that had a, a tough act to follow. She was, she was great. And Natalie has other interests. Uh, math is her favorite subject in school. She enjoys going to the beach, spending time with her friends. And she loves to bake. I sat in the Fisher kitchen not too long ago and watched Natalie bake chocolate chip cookies from scratch. <laughs> and they were, they were wonderful. They were delicious. They turned out great. And recently the Fisher family visited Belgium and France. And they were even there as Notre Dame burned which, needless to say, made quite an impression on her and, and, the, and the family. But since that first big trip outside of the United States, Natalie now thinks that she would like to do more traveling. So she's a woman after my own heart. <laughs> and I would be remiss in not mentioning Natalie's love for the family dog, Flash who probably would have happily come today had he been invited. <laughs> As we were nearing the end of the confirmation classes, I had given a fair amount of thought to what would, what would really sum up for me and, I, and hopefully for Natalie what had happened during those weeks and months. And so I asked her one important question. I said, Natalie, what does being a Christian mean to you? Her response was being nice to others. And when I asked her that question, her mother and her older brother, Will, were also in the room. And so they, they quickly pointed out that Natalie is always very kind to other people. And Will took that a bit further, saying that uh, Natalie is one of the first ones to try and help someone else, especially one of her classmates, if they're having a difficult time or having a hard time. And he also emphasized that Natalie goes out of her way to try to include other kids who might have been left out otherwise. So when I think back to last Sunday when Matt Fisher talked about the importance of the golden rule in his sermon and everything that I've gotten to know about the Fisher family and certainly with Natalie's response to my question, I would say that that important Christian principle is certainly being practiced um, with the Fisher family. So, Becky and Craig, you have my admiration for a job well done. <laughs> and as I've gotten to know these other young people, I have to say that the parents of these other young people also have done a terrific job. These are wonderful young people. You should be very proud. So, Natalie, Thank you for letting me share this confirmation journey with you. It's been a pleasure. Good morning. Good morning. It's been my pleasure and privilege to get to know Courtney uh, during the past few weeks. Um, I'm supposed to introduce her, but I think that many of you have known her much longer than I have. Mm -hmm. She was baptized here, and she grew up in this church. She's 15 now. 
which is the same age her mom Amy was when she first came to this church with her mom. Uh, Courtney enjoys snowboarding, plays field hockey, and softball. She is a hockey fan, whether she's watching her brother play or her favorite NHL team, which maybe I shouldn't name right now. <laughs> class, as it was for all of the kids, I think, was the trip to Street Reach in Hyannis, serving breakfast and distributing clothes to the homeless. Her brother Ryan and her cousin Ava also came along. Uh, this whole family is filled with compassion for the needy, and Courtney will be a blessing to this church and to this community. Friends, we are received into the fellowship of Christ the Church through the sacrament of baptism. These young people have found nurture and support in this community of faith through prayer and study, the support of their families, confirmation leaders, and journey partners they have been led by the Holy Spirit to affirm their baptism and their faith in Jesus Christ. During the past five months, you have been on a faith journey. And while the journey is individual for each of you, you have not been alone. You've been surrounded and supported along the way by many people. Um, your journey partners, Jim and I as your confirmation leaders, and your parents and your families. Um, uh, please stand and, um, oh, no, that's not right. Okay, so we would like... We would like you guys to remember two things, two very important things. That your faith does not end here, it begins. You're encouraged to explore, to question, even doubt, and grow in your beliefs and your sense of calling by God. And two, that you are never alone. God is with you, and this church is here for you. No matter how far you wander away from here, and you also always have each other as well, too. Hear now these words uh, from St. Paul uh, in his letter to new Christians, in his letter to the Ephesians, which give us a picture of the church uh, in which you're taking your place today. So now, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Rather, you are fellow citizens with God's people, and you belong to God's household. As God's household, you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is joined together in him, and it grows up into a temple that is dedicated to the Lord. Christ is building you into a place where God lives through the Spirit. Okay, so um, as you affirm your faith, we have a few questions for you. And the answer is, I do. So I don't have to prompt you, right? You know that the answer is, I do. <laughs> do you desire to affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? I do. Do you confess your faith in God, the Creator, in Christ, the Redeemer, and in the Holy Spirit, the Sustainer of the world? I do. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able. Amen. Will you continue to grow in the Christian faith and be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating the work and word of Christ in the life and in the world? I do. Um, okay, let's, Jim? Get in here. Ethan, may God bless you. May the peace of Christ surround you. And the Holy Spirit will be with you now and forever. Amen. Ethan, accept this cross. Oh, Peter. As a symbol of God's grace and affirm our mutual ministry with Christ to these new members. Let me get up now. Okay. God bless you and 
the peace of Christ around you. May the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Again, accept this cross. <laughs> As a symbol of God's grace and your faith. Matt, may God bless you, may the peace of Christ surround you, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. And I accept this cross as a symbol of God's grace and your faith in Jesus Christ. You can stay here with your sister, too. We could have invited you or invited them, too. May the peace of Christ surround you, and may the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. This <laughs> cross is a symbol of God's grace. Let us now, using words printed in the bulletin, accept this commitment. The members of the Federated Church Guardians and friends. And friends. <laughs> let us express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ with these newest members. In gratitude and joy, we welcome you their best partners in the life of the church. We promise you our continuing friendship and the prayers. Creator God, you receive Ethan, Ben, Matt, Natalie, and Courtney into your church at baptism, blessing them with your grace and the fullness of life. We rejoice and give thanks to you for the goodness you have shown them in the covenant of your creative and redeeming love. We ask that you increase in them the gifts of your Holy Spirit, love of neighbors, joy and service, peace and patience, <coughs> kindness and goodness, faithfulness and wisdom. Together may we live in the Spirit, building one another up in love, sharing in the worship of the Church, and serving the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome. You guys can go sit down now. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <coughs> Applause at this point is appropriate.
A meeting of the members and associate members of the Federated Church of Orleans will be held in the church building on Sunday, June 23, 2019, immediately following the church service for the following purpose. To approve the members of the Pastoral Search Committee as presented by the Cabinet. Given by hand this ninth day of June 2019, reading this on behalf of Jen Clark, our moderator. And just briefly while I have the microphone, I want to echo what, what Craig has said in welcoming Tina Williamson. Um, Tina came today especially because of the confirmation. And she, for those of you who don't know, she was a former Christian educator, director for our youth. And she played a really important role in the early Christian teachings and care of these young people when they were much, much younger. So we're very happy to have you, Tina.